All right, it is 5.30, so we are going to get started. We have a quorum. Uh, welcome to the October 1st. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Are there any adjustments to the agenda for tonight? I don't believe there are. Hey, Paul. Hey, everybody. Sorry, I was All right. To, no, there are no adjustments to the agenda. Great. Great. Then we will move into public comment. Um, if anyone would like to make public comment, please raise your digital hand. Um, or if you don't have a digital hand on the Zoom platform, just um, unmute yourself and state your name. You're breaking up, but I think you called on me. Yeah, okay. Um, thanks, do I sound okay? Mm -hmm. I don't know if, okay. Um, so, so first, first I just, just, just to thank, thank you. you. This, this is a really weird, weird year and it started off very strangely and I'm fortunate to have only one kid at home and she's kind of older. She's having kind of a great remote schooling experience. So um, I know that it's nuts and difficult and not great for everybody, but I just can see that it's been a tremendous amount of work and um, organization and just, it's, it's just appreciation, that's, that's all. I, I, I feel like all things considered, it's, it's actually going pretty well. Um, so, so thank, thank you, you. This is number one. Um, number two, as in the discussion about the next phase and how we look at it, um, I'm sure everyone saw Amherst's decision. I know that you know there are students in Amherst that are maybe not here, but we're not in a bubble. Um, and so I hope that if there's a decision to move forward with another phase, that there are guardrails put in place similarly to um, like what, what Paul was discussing earlier uh, on, in, on this side, I'm not saying it well. Um, I hope that we also have plans for, and this is how we would know if we had to slide back is what I'm trying to say. Like, what is it that we would watch that would, that would let us know if it was going the other way? I really hope it doesn't, but we also haven't been open long enough to know necessarily if, if there are issues in the school. Um, and my last thing is, I know I can't ask questions, but I would love to know how the teachers are doing just in this current experience and, and what's going on for them. I would, I, I think a lot of us are talking about kind of what, what it must be like and I, and, and would love to know what their experience is. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Um, and yeah, I think if, um, we can either address that now in terms of how it's going, how the teachers are doing, how everybody's doing, or we can talk about that with the review of the data. Uh, Annie, that's up to you. Uh, I will just say, first of all, thank you for that bit of appreciation because certainly our faculty and staff uh, deserve that. So thank you so much. They're working really hard. I would describe it as our teachers are June exhausted and uh, that was yesterday in September. So um, your gratitude is much appreciated because they're working harder than they ever have. And um, we are asking in different ways. The principals, uh, Jen has office hours. Uh, April has surveyed some of her faculty. And we are trying to get feedback on what is working and what isn't working and what options we have to make things uh, better. I know that the teachers would uh, just keep showing up and giving it 110%. But um, I don't know what comes after June tired and there's uh, eight more months to the school year. So, so <laughs> the reopening team will meet this week. That does include our education association representatives from that and teacher representatives from both buildings and our school nurses. So we knew going into this that our priority, our first our priority was to identify and implement mitigation strategies that would have the effect of reducing risk and keeping children and staff as safe as possible. And um, we'll see in the data, I mean, that seems to be working and we're, we're grateful for that. And now we also have to say, and um, it'd be nice if it were enjoyable, not just safe, right? <laughs> so we're gonna aim for that too. But thank you for asking that question. 
Thanks, Thanks Emily. Any, any other public comment? for tonight if um i know we just had some folks join us so we are in the public comment portion of the meeting if you'd like to make a public comment please raise your digital hand or come off mute and state your name if you can't uh, locate the digital hand oh, i'll go ahead and make it just a quick public comment um, as a parent of three kids who are all at hopkins Two, uh, two at the high school and one at the middle school that I see the teachers working really hard. I see them doing things this time around that they've never done before. I see them pushing themselves out of their comfort zone. I see them working hard to connect with their students. Um, I also see the student side of it. They feel, they're feeling the work. They're feeling the workload, um, you know, which is, as we expected, a lot more rigorous than the spring. Um, I know we'll arrive at the right balance. Um, I, and I... I, I, for one, am very grateful that um, that the teachers are um, trying all kinds of new um, and um, cutting edge pedagogy. Thank you. Any other public comment? I see none. All right. Um, just glancing through the participant list. All right, well, thank you. Um, appreciate the comments and I appreciate just also having the participants on here and having um, involvement in these school committee meetings. It really, um, we appreciate everybody's presence and um, being involved in the decisions that are being made and the discussions happening, so thank you. All right, we're gonna move into presentation and discussion items. The first one is uh, the plans for Hadley Elementary School in-person plan for universal screening. Ms. Dowd? Hi, thank you so much for letting me um, present tonight and be added to the agenda on such short notice. Um, but just as everyone has recognized, the teachers are working extremely hard and we're looking at moving forward, trying to collect as much data as possible on student performance. What we typically do in a school year is we do our universal screenings. And so what that looks like is that we have our students in front of us. We participate in fast testing, which for those of you who don't know, it's a reading assessment where we look at not only reading fluency, but comprehension. We also do the MAP math testing, which aligns very nicely with MCAS. So it allows us to gauge where the students are. In a typical year, we're very familiar with how that should roll out. Um, given the fact that our teachers are working extremely hard this year, and given that we have some students who are remote learners and some that are in person, we're trying to be mindful of how to collect the most accurate data, how to assess students, and how to make this process easier for families and also for the teachers. I agree with Dr. McKenzie's analysis of our teachers being um, June exhausted in September. Um, and when I, frankly, when I asked them to be thinking about the fast testing. Maybe for the kids. I'm sorry, it sounds like somebody hasn't muted yet. Um, so when I had asked this, the staff to um, be thinking about how we would roll out our assessments and how we would, we would assess the remote students in particular, the students that are in person, we, we already know how to handle that. But the students that are remote and then trying to coordinate with families on how to get them logged in, giving them passwords, making sure that the data that we collect, the assessments that are done, are done with fidelity. Um, and also, you know, it's, it might be hard for a parent not to try to help their child along. So there was going to be a lot of conversations with families about how to make sure that the remote assessments were done correctly. And uh, simply put, it, it was extremely overwhelming for some of our teachers who were, first of all, new to the assessment process. Um, but even some of our teachers who've had a lot of experience, it was another added um, concern that we weren't going to be doing the assessment process justice. We all recognize that we needed to go forward with assessments because some of these students have not been assessed since March um, with a screener. So we want to, we absolutely know that it's necessary that we start that process. So what I'm asking for this evening is some consideration around allowing 
um, grade levels to come into the building. I've worked with a small team to problem solve around what that might look like so that we still um, maintain our health and safety protocols. We've identified a space perhaps in the gym that we know, um, and I'm sure Paul can speak to this, that the um, airflow is is adequate. Um, we're also going to make sure that's, that um, whatever grade levels are in there, they're uh, at desks, they're, they're um, distanced. They would come into that entrance, they would sit down, they would be at a computer, the classroom teacher would be there, they would be allowed to take the assessments. If there were technical issues, it wouldn't fall on the families to try to problem solve. We know how to do that. We have people in-house that can help problem solve during the assessments, and we can see what the kids might need. Um, so as of right now, we would like to propose that. We understand that it's... Um, kind of allowing more students that were remote in the building. Um, but we really feel as though this would be a nice option for families rather than have them struggle at home and try to figure the, out the uh, assessment process to allow them to come in. Um, it would only be the children. They would be able to come in at grade levels. Um, we would have a schedule. We'd be mindful of who is coming in. Families would still have the option of being remote and if they chose to not come in, they felt as though that was unsafe. We could problem solve around that. We have a nice team of people who are exploring and trying to work through remote assessment and making it user friendly for families. So they would have that option. It would really only be those families that would choose to just send their kid in, drop them off for an hour, pick them up and be on their way. So um, that's the plan of as of right now. Um, and I wanted to just bring it in front of the school committee to see uh, if you had any questions about that or your feelings or concerns. No questions for me. Do you guys have questions? Yeah, can I just get a, can I, cause I'm not sure what this looks like. How many kids, mm -hmm. when is this happening? Kind of, do we have more information on how this looks and when it's going to happen and all of that? Yeah, so we, we recognize, well, first of all, we want to get the um, information from the families. So we need to at least ask what they're comfortable with doing coming in. There might be a big percentage of people who don't want to come in versus uh, there might be everybody who might say, yeah, I'd rather just be able to drop my child off. What we would do is we would do one grade level per day. Um, so that we would roll it out. Our testing window is approximately four weeks. So that would allow us time to do that. So we would have one grade level per day, open up a window of testing, allow the children to come in. Um, you're probably looking, each grade level is a little different, so I can't give you specific numbers. Um, but after my phone calls with some families, I would say most of the remote families would prefer this option. Um, I've had some very, very candid conversations with families um, since the start of school. And while I appreciate some people really recognize that remote learning is being successful for their family, I've heard um, quite the opposite for many of my families. And this is typically in grades K through one. So, um, so those are the families we'd like to get in um, and have assessments done. And I think our largest grade, I want to say, is roughly 40 students, maybe maybe a little more than that, Jen. But So the students who are already eligible for in-person learning would not necessarily need to be a part of the grade level in-person. No. That, that assessment, these assessments go very quickly. Math takes a little bit longer, but FAST is, has that acronym for a reason. It's quite fast. Yeah. Um, and so it would be those students who are currently remote whose parents opt to have them come in because the parents would prefer that screening. And if people are wondering what we use uh, these data for, it helps teachers to plan their instruction. It also gives us, uh, lets us know if there are students who are really uh, significantly, at, significantly at risk for not meeting grade level benchmarks. Um, and some folks might be thinking, well, if the next phase, if things continue as they are, I mean, we still have. Uh, several weeks before October 26th, um, couldn't we just wait? And that's a bit uncomfortable to have six entire weeks go by of school where if students are really struggling and there are indicators that they could benefit from Title I services or something else, it's a long time to wait for an early reader. So our largest grade is roughly, I wanna say 40 combined. Some of those students are already in person, so it would be less than that and not all of the remainder would necessarily opt to come in. 
It's a hard number to predict, um, but again, our grade levels are so small. Since the closure, we have, um, not since the closure, since the reopening from school, we have lost some families to homeschooling. We've lost about approximately 30 students across grades pre-K through six. Um, so those numbers have dipped a little bit. Um, so I am feeling like approximately, we could say maybe 20 students per grade level. And Jen, that's from kindergarten to six? That's uh, for the screening, yeah. for allowing them to come in. Yes, we're working differently with the um, kindergarten team. Actually, um, we're anticipating to do it outside. Um, this kindergarten screening looks a little different. We're looking for fine motor and gross motor skills. And so um, it would just be best if we could do it outside. We want to act within the weather, uh, the nice weather. So we're hoping to do that in the next uh, week or so. And I think every single remote kindergarten family will take us up on that offer. I'd be surprised if they didn't. I'll say I'm, I'm supportive of this. I trust you all to follow good protocols. It seems like you all figured that out and it just makes a lot of sense. So I'm in support of it as well. And I think you kind of sort of, I, I think I can make um, the assumption based on everything you said so far, Jen, that since it's going to be one grade level per day, there will be adequate cleaning in between grade levels coming in. That was my only concern, but you kind of answered that as you're answering Ethan's question. So I'm in support of it. We thought a lot about the health and safety protocols. So we will have the same kind of procedures that we have now. Kids enter the building, they have hand sanitizer. We ask that they wash their hands. If they need to go to the bathroom, we'll have a schedule for that. Again, to Dr. McKenzie's point, it's extremely fast. Um, but I think if we were to try to roll it out, doing one at a time, we would not make that four week window. Um, with remote families trying to figure out the assessment process. And then I think we would wonder um, how valid the data was and how successful the assessments were. And we just don't wanna have to redo it. We also don't wanna wait. Um, we need to know this information as soon as possible. Yeah, I'm supportive of it as well. I think you're trying to do the best you can in replicating what you would be able to do on site, you know, um, in a normal school year, so. I, and I agree being timely about it makes a lot of sense. I, uh, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I also Samantha. agree. I think the, the plan to, to phase them in and out makes a lot of sense and to do it early as a baseline for the beginning of the year makes a lot of sense. I do have questions about um, for additional assessments and that might be for another topic. I don't know, if Annie, if you have this on the same agenda, but I know that um, this statewide, the question about MCAS has come up and there's a, a resolution being passed around uh, school committees to um, to take a position on uh, uh, on MCAS specifically. That feels like a, a, a different subject, yeah. but I want to make sure that authorizing this doesn't necessarily open the Pandora's box of all the standardized assessment that the state is excited to throw our teachers and our students away. No, so these these assessments are what we would do, formerly known as Dibbles, Paul's, Paul's favorite. Uh, so the universal screening that we would do three times a year in order to identify students who may be at risk for not meeting grade level benchmarks, to identify what we call tier two or more intensive interventions. So we identify specific evidence-based interventions to help with the problem that, that they may be having. Um, and then we look at how much, so frequency, duration, and type of intervention. We monitor that over an eight week period to, see, to make sure that the student is making progress. And um, these are all our, this is in-house. In it's about screening and progress monitoring, not about um, kind of the standardized achievement testing that the state does. You are correct. This, as of now, the state has published its uh, high school MCAT schedule and, um, as of now, the state is saying we can anticipate our three through eight schedule. Um, to your point, that's a, a different discussion that the school committee can have and adopt a position on, but these two things are completely, uh, they're separate. Yeah, I mean, our testing is not about the state standardized testing. Okay, understood. I'm, I'm in support of this testing. Jennifer, can I ask one more question then I, then I promise I'll stop. Um, is it, is it safe to say that these kids that come in for testing won't have any interaction with the kids that are in the school? We will keep them separate. We're committed to doing that. 
Um, and so, yes, we will, we're very mindful of that. So we will make sure that they are cohorted together and they won't be with the um, in-person students, correct. It's gonna be tricky with coverage, but I do think that we can get that done um, in a safe way and making sure that the remotes and, and the in-person students are not interacting with one another. Although I would guess that they would love to see their classmates. Something else that I would love to consider um, going forward too is when we talk about the rephasing or the phases, just from a building perspective, and I know that we were, people were asking how things have been going, um, I wouldn't be able to really articulate to you all how difficult it has been as a building principal to have conversations with families that really, really want their students back in person. And I know that we've made a commitment to, um, to just start with special populations, but the families that I'm hearing the most from are the students that have already been identified re that, are, that need services such as Title I students who need that extra added support and also my kindergarten and first grade families. They're working really hard, they're home. Um, some of them are feeling very isolated. Um, and so I, I wanted to have the committee thinking about before our next phase, if that is on October 26th, at least allowing my team to be looking at the protocols that we have for having students come back in person, if we were to give everybody the option of coming back in person, um, to be thoughtful and mindful that kindergarten and first grade students in particular, those are very large grade levels. There's a lot of planning that goes in place just for their day-to-day -day, uh, procedures. And so I would like you to consider, you don't obviously have to make any comment now, um, but I would appreciate you to think about um, allowing some of those students to come back prior to the, the start of phase two, if the numbers warranted that. And I think what you're you're referring to, Ben, is the possibility that if the school committee had decided that on October 26th, we move into phase two, and in phase two, 100% of students are eligible, families still always have the option of remaining remote. Of course. But that um, perhaps kindergarten uh, might be in in the middle of the week before or the Thursday before mm -hmm. to have the younger children have a day or two without the entire school uh, mm -hmm. there. So. Yes. And we have a precedent for that with preschool coming in a few days um, later. We do. And then the, the yeah. full start, yeah. I just didn't want, um, I know there's been a lot of talk about, you know, um, kindergarten being special populations all on its own because given the age level of who they are, we have our preschool back 100%. I think those are the families that are really struggling with um, with their children being remote learners from, from my impressions. And I've, I've spoken to so many families um, in the past couple of weeks and I, I can feel that this is all a difficult, this is a difficult time for everybody, the teachers, building principals, administration, school committee. Um, but I, I find value in having those hard conversations because it allows me to get clear on how we can make the next steps more successful. Um, and so that I just wanted, I wanted to put it out there so that the committee was also thinking about it. I know you are, I know you hear from, from your own um, circle of, of people and, and you have a great working relationship with Dr. McKenzie and myself. And so I just want to be thinking about uh, next steps as we always are. We've been thinking about next steps since March. So this isn't a little different. So Annie, is this something that that a reopening group is gonna consider? come forward with the proposal? Yes, so we meet on this next Thursday, we meet a week from today, prior to the next school committee meeting. Okay. Yeah. And that would be something teed up that we could decide if we wanted at the next school mm -hmm. meeting? That's really the only Correct. chance we'd have. Okay. Yes. You yeah. meet in two weeks, right? On the 15th? You meet on the 15th. The a week, team mm -hmm. a week before, week. yeah, before the yeah. reopening. So Correct. we can yeah. um, reevaluate the data again at that yeah. time. We're going to do it again tonight. Um, and make a decision at that time about um, the possibility of the kindergarten population starting a few days before that 26th, six-week mark. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
that, that makes sense. sense. Thank you, Jen. Happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah. Happy, birthday. Yeah, happy birthday. <laughs> I'm actually at my sister's house and I've been threatening them all to be very quiet. Um, <laughs> wow. All right. Okay, anything, thanks, else, anything else, Jen? That's it. And I, I, I again, I want to thank the families and, and you all and my students who have been coming in person and remote and trying to make this start of the school year as successful as they possibly can. It's been challenging. Um, it's brought out hard conversations with one another about what our priorities are. But I think all in all, I, I'm so proud to be part of this school community. And I know some of you already know that I've, I've school choiced my own children here. And so they have a unique perspective on, on their schooling experience. And it's meant the world of, to me as a parent to see how hard everybody's been working. And so I, I want to thank the staff. And Dr. McKenzie comes over every single morning to walk around and see what's going on and, and ask, you know, how, how things are going and, and chatting with people. And so I'm, I'm really proud to be part of this school community. And the fact that we're talking about assessments, while some, some districts are still struggling on, on reopening plans, um, I think it's really says a lot about our leadership and it says a lot about our staff and our school community. So I just want to say thank you. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Jen. Happy birthday. Thanks. Happy thank birthday. you. Happy birthday. Bye. Okay, our, our next uh, topic is the introduction of the town administrator, Ms. Carolyn Brennan. Um, Annie, would you like to do that? I would love to. Carolyn, are you on? I can't. See, I guess I can look and find the participants. I'm hoping she is, but um, maybe not. Jane, do you know if uh, maybe? Well, I am going to introduce Carolyn nonetheless. We do have uh, David Nixon, who I believe has worked with the town for, I want to say, 15 or 16 years, for quite a long time. Some of you may know better than I, and has done a fantastic job. Um, he is retiring and he will officially, I believe his job will be done at the end of this calendar year. And the select board, I think was very wise to appoint a town administrator just recently who can now overlap with David for about six months. That's Ms. Brennan. Ms. Brennan was formerly the executive director for the Council on Aging in East Longmeadow. I had, I was part of the interview committee that interviewed town administrators. She had a phenomenal interview. And she has shown up enthusiastically and joyfully. Uh, I've already talked with her um, a number of times about the schools and uh, just how we can work together in town. So I know she intended to be here, but I still wanted to just say welcome to her. And if she's not able to be here right now, perhaps she can join us in another evening. But a big welcome to her. And I know we're gonna have a great working relationship. That's great, thank you, Annie. All right, next, the Edward Hopkins Foundation request for a sign. This is exciting. Yeah, so I am going to share my screen and um, well, I think I'm going to share my screen. And that's not the screen we want to share. We want to share this one, right? Okay. Uh, so, Edward Hopkins Foundation, Mr. Foreman has asked. Um, the school committee, if the, he brought it to the planning board and the planning board asked that the school committee actually vote their approval on this. And then Edward Hopkins Foundation will go back to the planning board. So um, they're asking to uh, create an aesthetically matching monument style sign for Hopkins Academy. And I have an image of that, I think, I hope, there we go. So this is what they are looking to do for Hopkins Academy and seeking our approval. Although ours, of course, would not say Granby High School, but Hopkins Academy, it just gives you an idea of what it would look like. Um, and again, the planning board, I believe it's the planning board has asked that the school committee formally vote approval before Edward Hopkins Foundation returns to the planning board. This would be out front of Hopkins and would replace the white sign that is out there currently. Are there any questions or, or concerns, comments from the committee? Paul, you're muted. Paul, you're muted. So um, it's a very gracious gesture. And uh, I, I think uh, 
I'd love for that sign to be replaced. So thank you. A couple of questions is about design. Are they uh, envisioning? I saw that Granby sign had an image of their their mascot. Would we do the same? Um, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. And Mr. Foreman had to travel. Okay. It did say on that so sign that it was just to going to sign replaced. That I didn't ask any questions. So, <laughs> Annie, on that on that letter you shared, it did. I thought it did have a quote of what it was just going to say. I mean, that might not be the what what it ends up being, but I think it just. The sign will simply Academy. say Hawkins Academy founded 1664. But I'm not sure if they're etching a hawk or anything in. They don't say that. You're right. Thank you, Ethan. I mean, personally, if someone were to ask me, I'd, I'd prefer our um, the emblem, right? The circular emblem we have. I think that's very distinguished. Okay. Um, I can certainly uh, provide feedback to the designers, which I think are Mr. Foreman. Is our son with Kevin, the other person? So yeah. again, a very gracious. And Brian Aloisi, thank you, Mr. Aloisi, as well. Thank you, thank ah. you. Ah, so uh, I just I'd love to see the final design before they they put it up. I think it's very very generous of them. So thank you. It's awesome. I think approval of a final design is definitely warranted. Annie, I would definitely love your uh, eyes on it, um, and I don't know if you necessarily want to or need to bring it to the school committee. We would welcome it. Of course, but I definitely want, want your eyes on it at least. So may I just ask this question? Is the school committee comfortable um, with, uh, I think that the planning board is looking for a vote from the school committee. And I know that his meeting, the Hopkins Foundation meeting with the planning board is next week. Um, you folks don't meet until the week after that. Um, if uh, it could be that just as Ethan, I think Ethan might be right, that it's just simply going to say Hopkins Academy founded 1664. Um, is the school committee comfortable with that? And uh, my judgment, if there's something else that's proposed. Yeah, I would think, I mean, I would think that if it's a departure from what's in the letter, you know, that we're, it sounds like we're in favor of A, we're definitely supportive of the idea. We're thankful that they've got the uh, the grant and the labor that is being donated here and the idea and the initiative, but, and the design, the general design of, of the, the structure and the message as stated in the letter in terms of Hopkins Academy and the founding year. But if there's any departure from that, um, yes, I think it needs to go through okay. to you, Annie. And if it allows for our review, I, I think it would be nice for us to be able to review it. Okay. If it's departing from the letter. Okay. Yeah. All right. It would be nice. I just Googled that emblem, right? That would be really nice to put on there if that's possible. It's a, it's a theme we have on our other um, external facing documents and websites and such. Yeah. I want lights. I want a fountain. Okay. All yeah. right. <laughs> we can tell Brian Aloisi that and we'll tell that then. Yeah. Get the fundraising. Perfect. Hey, sure. Uh, so I didn't, I'm, I didn't add this as a vote. Uh, may I ask the school committee to take a vote so I can, that's what he needs. To planning board. Motion to approve um, the acceptance of funding from the Edward Hopkins Foundation for the sign as stated in the letter. Seconded, and thank you a lot for the general yeah. thoughts and donation. Agreed, all in favor? Aye. Aye. It is unanimous, yes, thank, thank you. Thank you, very nice of them. And okay, so how about public health data? So here's where we are. Let me just get to the right place here. Excuse me. That's not where I want to be. Now let's try this again. Here we are. Okay. So most recently, the last time we met, I can't remember when the last time we met was. So there's been two weeks in between. Okay. The last time folks had seen this was probably up through the 16th, does that sound about right? Maybe we met on the 17th and that sounds about right. So the following week we saw, um, we continue to see 
50 as a total case count in Hadley. Uh, the last 14 days, zero. And then the, on Wednesday, 9.23, the average daily incidence rate was less than one at 0.6. And the test positivity rate was 0.08%, so less than 1%. Uh, this past Wednesday, the case count in Hadley remains at 50. Case count last 14 days, zero. The average daily incidence rate, this is not Hadley, the lavender is Hampshire County. The average daily incidence rate in Hampshire County, 1.7. The test positivity rate, 0.13%. Uh, and, um, see here. and then uh, there's just a graph. These data are just represented also on a graph. So those are the same data as well. Um, we do not have, we have zero case count right now in school, faculty and staff. So two of the things that we were looking at would be um, evidence of community transmission. One of the big ifs was um, how would school reopening affect uh, community transmission? So evidence of community transmission. And we were looking to see a testing positivity rate uh, that was less than 3%. And um, a uh, average daily incidence rate that was nine or fewer per 100,000. And we were going to closely monitor any evidence of school transmission again right now. Case count, which is not the same as transmission, but there's zero case counts. So there's no evidence of transmission in schools. And just before the school committee talks about these data, so I don't forget, I really want to say thank you to obviously to our staff, but to our families. So whenever our school nurses have called and said, um, you know, we, we'd like you, we've had perhaps a couple of uh, dismissals, um, parents have immediately responded. Parents have been very good about erring on the side of caution and uh, keeping children home. If they have any question that a child is presenting with anything, in the screening symptom list. So parents have been such phenomenal partners and our students have been so good about distancing and mask wearing. I am, um, it's just incredible. I really, I thought that I was nervous that this would be the, oh gosh, you know, put on your mask, put up your mask. And it's, it's just from the very youngest children to our high school students, they've been fantastic. So um, the only way that we can creep carefully and um, very carefully toward as normal as we can get is if we all do our part and that mask wearing, paying attention to our distance and washing our hands makes all the difference. So thank you to the students and thank you to the families. Uh, so here are your data and I turn it over to the school committee. Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, at first glance, it seems, I mean, we're, we've all, you know, read the papers and have seen the latest in terms of Hampshire County numbers, and we see the uptick there in the graph um, and the numbers, but I believe we are, I mean, from everything that I'm seeing here, that we are still tracking within and under our thresholds that we set in terms of, you know, if this were a stoplight report, these would still be green in terms of moving forward for um, as planned. Yeah. I'm literally hearing crickets right now. <laughs> you froze for a minute. Froze. So I think I you did? Were, yeah, you were saying, Heather, that this would be a green light and then you kind of froze. Oh, sorry. <laughs> green light, that's all. I did hear crickets too, though, Heather, not a metaphorical crickets. <laughs> yeah, this is I think it's important to remind families that this is not, there's another meeting between now and uh, October 26. And also, but we have the principals have sent out uh, surveys and families, please fill these out. Um, that doesn't mean that if, uh, if there is something occurred, school transmission something and, and we were uh, we were taking a different course or we had to stay where we were. Um, doesn't mean those things couldn't happen, but it's much easier to um, adjust 
to students not arriving than to not plan for students arriving. So please fill those out when you get um, the surveys. These data look great. They're exactly what we hoped we would see. So that's really positive. I do have a question, Annie. I know in the, um, the listserv of other school committee members, I've seen some um, comments about the state giving data that is, is inconsistent with what local um, uh, boards of health are reporting. And I'm wondering whether you also read some of those same posts and um, factored that into this data uh, to ensure that it's accurate. So these data are taken directly from the DPH dashboard. I will make sure that prior to October 15th that I asked the Board of Health directly if they have any reason to believe that the DPH data are not accurate. I So let me say I haven't asked that question directly and I will. I would be shocked if um, knowing how closely I work with our Board of Health, how quick they are to call me and I am to call them, I would be shocked if, if they thought the data were erroneous. Um, I, I would be shocked if they thought there was something I needed to pay attention to. So I'm going to assume that these are, um, in fact, that we can rely on this, but I will ask that question directly. Great. I'll see if I can find, there's a whole thread of different school committees across the state reporting that what the state data show and what their local data show is inconsistent. So I just wanted to make sure that you had covered that, but I'll see what I can find in terms of those threads and make sure that they're in your hands so you can uh, make sure we're not in that same situation. Sure, I think it had to do with them looking at a three-week average, if I'm right, if I'm remembering that, Humera. I'm not. I'm not certain um, exactly what the situation was. I just remember thinking um, that that was unusual. I also remember seeing something about the state was giving weekly data, and then it decided that it was going to every two weeks. And there's just a lot of question there. Uh, there's no, um, it, it's no surprise that the state is very keen on reopening, period, and is doing everything they can to reopen. It's just a matter of trusting that we're all looking at the right data. I just, so we'll say the NAS DPH uh, dashboard, it refers to case count in the last 14 days, but those report, reports come out every single week. Um, so those reports are uh, updated weekly, um, yeah, it reflects like changes weekly. Map. Maybe it's the shade, that shaded map one that Desi, the, the school, I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's the DPH and then there's the shaded map, right? Those are... No, they're the exact same thing. Same thing? Okay. The Mass Department of Public Health, Desi is, not, um, Desi is not creating, nor is it disseminating public health data unless it comes from Mass DPH. The dashboard is 100% Mass Department of Public Health. Got it. Those are their data. Great. So just picking up on what, what Heather had said too. So remind me of our criteria, right? We had three metrics that we were looking at about whether we would move to the next phase. Uh, that test positivity rates were 3% or less. That incidents, average daily incident rate per 100,000 was nine or less. But anything, obviously, if we went from 1.7 to 8, in a week, that doesn't mean we had talked about the fact that we're also looking for um, any sort of, uh, if, I'll say this too, that would be something that would get our Board of Health's attention as well, but just the general metric that um, we want that to be green or yellow, this is the metric here, and that we want to be certain, um, we're looking for any evidence of school transmission Oh, Carolyn's here. Uh, any evidence of school transmission is something that um, we would, that could be one that trumped the other two, right? So school transmission would take kind of, we may take immediate action. And that, assessing that school transmission, we talked about clinical judgment, the nurses, board of health, our advising physician, but also if you recall the slideshow, uh, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed and DPH, I think did an excellent job of laying out when we would call for a mobile testing unit. So um, that slideshow is available in that public folder that anybody in the public can get to where the superintendent newsletters are and school committee materials. So that slideshow that showed if we had three cases in a grade or if we had 
3% in a school would call this number, um, they would also help us sort out uh, if school transmission were happening. So those were the three big indicators, average daily incident rate, testing positivity rate, and school transmission. School transmission could trump, these two other things could be exactly where we want them, but school transmission could certainly drive a closure of a school or the district. And we've had school now for a couple of weeks and we've had maybe... This is day 14 for children and day 25 for adults. So 100% of faculty have been in for, when I say 25, that doesn't include weekends. So I'm talking just my school days, school day days. Um, yeah, five weeks for, uh, three weeks for children, five weeks for adults. And on average, we're getting 100 or so children across both schools or? Uh, yeah, I think we started at close to 130. That's dropped since then, but I think we're still about 100 at both schools. And obviously no cases, no, no, no incidents to report. No, we've had none, adults or children. I get completely superstitiously, weirdly freaked out every time I say that. I'm just going on record. This is where my science goes out the window. I'm like, okay, we said that enough. Let's not jinx ourselves. Well, so. Clearly, I mean, there was incidents at UMass, right, with the students. And then there yeah. was a, 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 a worker at Fort River in Amherst who was just diagnosed. And that came out today. So um, you know, clearly, it's there's still some transmission, obviously, in our county. Um, yeah. That's yeah. good to be. Yeah. Annie, did you say that we were, we started at about 130 students and we've declined since then? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, eligible populations, I just, I want to say it was just under 130. And some students have, um, mostly at Hopkins Academy, that students have decided rather than doing kind of the remote in person, that they're just doing remote from home. And then, as Jen pointed out, we've also had families who have um, unenrolled entirely, either gone to homeschooling, just unenrolled entirely. And those were those people who had started uh, remote in person at the elementary? School? Both, both, in both groups, people have remote. Some people didn't start at all. Some people uh, were remote and some people were in person. That's a mix. So hopefully, some, if not all, of those folks will come back when we can. We certainly hope so. Unfortunately, today is October 1, so the deciding day is today. That drives all Chapter 70 funding for next year. But we uh, welcome anybody back all the time. We'd love to have any families back and any feedback they'd want to provide that would um, encourage them to come back. Please reach out directly to me. People are always welcome. We'd love to have them. Um, at the elementary oh. school, for those who were in person and then chose to pull out altogether, can you comment about why that might be the case? Um, so, a uh, range of reasons. In some cases, um, there has been choices to, in some cases, students, it, school choice students have uh, just opted not to do the, they're not continuing to do the drive, the transportation. Uh, a whole, there's a whole range of reasons. And um, I mean, clearly it's not because we're not offering in-person education. No, I, I think I, I, there's a whole range of reasons. I think that there are people who, um, who very much uh, want in-person and that I can say there has been, Jen has received some feedback from the staff, has received some feedback from families who very much want in-person learning and um, in lieu of having a remote schedule, they have just, it, they have determined that it's just easier to homeschool than to do that, that they were looking for in-person and other people, but there's not one reason. So that funding today was the cutoff you said for the state. So if they've unenrolled, that means we will not get uh, state funding for those families? It just drives down the foundation enrollment number for, uh, which is what the chapter 70 funding is based on for the following fiscal year. So I'd just like to say related but unrelated, Annie, thank you, first of all, for putting these together and thank you for including them in your weekly emails. Um, I think it's important for people to be able to just get a quick glance at them and again, having that link to the DPH in there is helpful. 
And then the other thing that I wanted to say for any families that might feel uncomfortable that we meet again, October 15th, and then there's one and a half, two weeks ish in between there's a whole week in between. If something were to change drastically, that school committee could meet, um, urgently in that week in between if something needed to be addressed that it wouldn't just go unaddressed um, for two weeks till our next meeting if something needed to be addressed sooner. Yeah, Tara, I, I agree. I think with, you know, we, if you read the paper, or you see some of the, the trends just this week, that if there is a need to even meet before two weeks from now, we will. Um, if there is a need to meet to review data to provide clarity, we will. Um, but right now, it, I mean, it seems like, yes, we see the, the uptick in Hampshire County slight, but we are still within our measured with measures that we've established, at least for today. <laughs> That's helpful. I think fitting on that, Annie, you said it's harder to, you know, if we're, so our plan is we will open if these numbers persist like this, if we stay within our agreed to criteria. Um, but we can, as Tara said, we can assess if there's a change, if there's an incident in the school or the trend suddenly skyrockets, that'll catch our attention. But I think parents need to, to be able to look at this data that come out on a weekly basis. Every Wednesday, it comes out from the state um, and um, get a sense so they, they can start planning that on the 26th, these numbers continue in that same rate, the school will move into its second phase. Right, I agree. Okay. So I, uh, I think what I had meant to do under action items was have the sign on the action item. This is not an action item until the next time that you meet, but it is important. Please families fill out the survey, please, please, please. So that we can plan accordingly. You receive it from Ms. Camuso, Ms. Dowd, both of your children in both schools, and it will also be in the weekly newsletter. And don't worry about filling it out more than once because we will figure out if we see the same last name eight times figure it out. So. And I, I know you already said that. this, but I'm just going to uh, say it. there's a survey that asks about remote learning, but that's not the survey we're talking about. There's a very specific survey that says, uh, when we reopen, do you intend to send your child to in-person learning? That's the survey that just got released a, a day or two ago. And is oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Himara. It is due in like one week or two weeks? Yes. October 9th, please. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying that. Great. And so I, I, I do think Carolyn is with us. If Carolyn wanted to say hello. Carolyn Brennan, are you with us? I thought I admitted her. I see her on here. Um, I great. am. I, I introduced I, you. I, I, <laughs> I am so sorry. Hey, I just was yeah. totally what you don't. This is what you don't want to do your first two weeks of a town administrator. Um, <laughs> I apologize. Well, I was, I was just, I'm so horrified. I thought it was at 630. I'm driving home. I said, I better check at the light. And I open up my, uh, my day timer and it's at 530 and I'm a half hour from home. So then I just tried to get on with my computer. It didn't work. So I tried my phone. So I apologize. I'd love to have my face there so you can see it. But um, I just wanted to say hello to the school committee members. I look forward to meeting with you um, and, and also getting to know the parents. Um, it's so hard to do that now with COVID. But that is my goal in the next year is to, to be in some of the events so that I can meet parents. Um, and that I appreciate all of the work the schools are doing. Um, I can just tell you a little bit about myself. I have been immersed in municipal government for over 30 years in very different roles, but mostly as a senior center director, which is very different. Um, I'm really a non-traditional town administrator, um, but it's been a goal I've been working on for a long time. And I'm so happy that Hadley chose to take that chance and hire me. And uh, I have to tell you, I, ha I am so impressed with the relationship between the schools and uh, the town departments and the, the select board, it is not your normal, or at least it hasn't been my normal working in different communities. So I appreciate that. And I just hope to be a part of that to maintain that relationship. Um, and I just appreciate so much um, just working with Annie for two weeks, two and a half weeks, and she's just seeing how willing she is to support the town and then vice versa. So 
Hopefully another meeting, you'll see my face. <laughs> Do not apologize, Carolyn. Carolyn was uh, on Triboard last night where I was cooking my dinner and burning it and the buzzer was going off in the background. It was, I was really doing a great job of representing the schools as Mr. Percy can attest to. So, <laughs> Carolyn, not even close to, to my performance last night. Well, we're glad you could join us, Carolyn. This is Heather and uh, we're looking forward to working with you. I am too, thank you, Heather. Great. All right. So um, we're going to move on to personnel report and then the school committee reports. Yep. Not a lot to report. We're very uh, congratulations. Some of our, our one of our ESPs has uh, has gotten a full time teaching position. Very happy for uh, our staff when they move forward in their careers. Congratulations to Miss Pipchinski of Hopkins Academy on her retirement. So. Uh, really, we wish her the best and thank her so much for her career as an educator in Hadley Public Schools. And congratulations also to our bus driver, Mr. Tucci, who uh, is also retiring. So congratulations to him. We have appointed um, a long-term substitute of you for the entire year, but we'll repost in the spring for uh, Ms. Pipchinski's uh, English position. And we've hired uh, Mr. Varnon, who's an experienced teacher in the Valley, uh, experienced English teacher. So it's wonderful to have him. And thank you uh, to our families as we've uh, gotten these things sorted out. So thanks for working with us and being patient. And that's our personnel report. Thanks, Annie. All right, moving on, uh, policy. Uh, the next meeting that you guys have is in two weeks. Mm -hmm. So uh, following the school committee meeting. So we'll hear from you guys after that. Mm -hmm. um, Finance Tri Board. So that was last night. Ethan, mm -hmm. you want to give an update on that or Annie? Go right ahead. I'm happy to, to yeah. <laughs> report back that her dinner wasn't completely ruined. No. Um, <laughs> uh, no, I mean, there, there, not a whole lot. Uh, I know last time that, that I was here, I mentioned a grant that was coming back to the school committee or coming back to the schools, I guess I should say. Um, there is, and they just kind of reiterated that last night that there's going to be about $32,000. It's going to be replenished to the school's funds at some point. And that's about it. Okay. All right. Fields and the CPA update, Paul. So the, um, I think, I don't know if folks have had a chance to go out and look at the Hopkins fields. They're looking really good. The path is there. The asphalt path is there. They're, um, I think they're going to start seeding soon. They're, they were working on the irrigation. Um, and so it's really coming together. It's, it's, I think they're actually ahead of schedule. They were gonna, they're gonna have to put in a new well. Um, and so that was a, something that um, you all had given me approval to, to sort of authorize small, uh, it wasn't so small, but it was within the bounds. I think it was estimated around $40,000 because they were potentially, you know, with the well, they were gonna have to uh, drill it down a little bit and they didn't know how far they're gonna have to go. So it's actually something, and I need to follow up with Chris to see how that went. Um, Last time I checked, actually, it hadn't been installed. So, uh, and then there was something from DPW today about the the, the driveway from, from Middle Street. They're going to start working on that. Yes, thank you for reminding me of that. So we can thank the town for that. That was really wonderful of the select board. David Phil, the chairman of the select board, called me and said that they had some money left over in their paving account. So there will be milling that will happen. And I sent the three dates to the school committee. So it could be, I think the 16th, the 19th, or I wanna say, or the 20th, but there were three possible dates where they would mill. They're, they're aware of the buses, they're aware of all that, but they do that kind of grinding down, but we could still use the middle street entrance. Um, and then it will be paved on a Saturday after that. So thank you to the town. Thank you to Chairperson Phil for bringing that to our attention. It's a really big thing to improve that entrance to Hopkins. Yeah, that's great. I know we've been talking about that for some time and we're yeah. just thrilled to, uh, and thankful that the town is able to, to do that as part of their, um, their work. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Paul, Paul, can I ask, is there a, is there a a rendering of what the fields will look like after that I can see, like what where the fields will be. And yeah, sure, I'll email it to you, Ethan. Okay, two phase. Yeah, we definitely have that from our Berkshire Design, the group, and 
I would like to say too, there's a, a temporary sign that's been put out there acknowledging all the, the generous donors. Again, it's just temporary. Um, so we're, we're working on something more permanent. Yeah, I'll send that to you Ethan. Thank you. I just wanted to say, I haven't stopped to look at it myself, but I drove by Middle Street and I did glance over and there's no more dirt piles. And I looked and it was nice and smooth and I could see the, the where they had um, put the grass seeds in and whatnot. And I went, oh, I got kind of excited as I was driving and had to redirect myself. <laughs> so it's exciting. Yeah, it is. Thanks, Sarah. From, from Middle Street. I'll have to stop like by. I'd like to also shout out just to the neighbors. I know it's been a long summer and, and dry and dusty, and um, so I appreciate their patience. That's great. All right, and then the collaborative, Humera. Yes, in your inbox is the latest uh, board packet. Um, uh, nothing uh, uh, unusual to report. The um, executive director search for that organization continues. Um, yeah, check it out. All right. We have just a couple action items left then, uh, housekeeping stuff. So we have the approval of accounts payable warrants that were submitted in September. Is there a motion to approve the warrants? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. I will abstain. Uh, approval of warrants submitted September 2020. So payroll. Yes, I moved. Seconded. All in favor. Aye. 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 I'll abstain. Uh, and then we have minutes from the 13th and from the 24th. Any revisions or um, concerns about those minutes? No. Okay, is there a motion to approve the minutes from August 13th and August 24th? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, that concludes our business for tonight, which is good because my internet is acting up. So <laughs> <laughs> we um, will meet on the 15th, as we said, in two weeks. We'll meet again uh, on November 5th. And again, on November 19th, we're looking forward to meeting with everyone. Anything else before we conclude? All right, nice to see you all. I do have an announcement. Yeah, Humera. I'd love to make an announcement that um, the um, work on making Hadley a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community continues. And on October 8th, there is um, another book reading if you're new to learning about the way in which um, racism manifests itself in a community or the way in which um, structural uh, policies um, uh, can be exclusive um, and um, antithetical to our goals of a more equitable society, then you can start with a beginner book um, like White Fragility. Um, there's also a great K-12 related book that we're reading called Despite Best Intentions, and also um, one about uh, racialized trauma, which is new to me. It's called My Grandmother's Hands. Um, so if you're interested in any of those, um, feel free to email. Um, if you're interested in reading the, that book, joining us that evening, or just reading the book and um, following along, then you can email me or Annie and we'll put you in touch with the right place to sign up. And Humera, thank you. I will also include it again in the weekly newsletter. So I assume that link is still live and people can get to it from there as well. So I'll, I'll have it again. Great, thank you. And Humera, there's audio books of those too? Yes. All of them? There are audio books on Audible. They are, you can get the books on Kindle. And if you find a a really hard time in getting it. I can, I'm happy to loan you a digital device with a book on it for you to read my version. Thanks, Humera. Yeah, thanks for doing that, Humera. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Nice to night. see you all. Have a good night. Everybody. Have a good night. Good to see everyone. Have a great night.